The older I got, the more I realized the importance behind my name and why my parents gave me such a beautiful, unique name. That being said, from Eritrea, my name is Yorit Haile. My friends call me Annie and my family calls me Somai. It's only until recently that I learned how important it is to embrace and own the name that is given to you. My name is Silvana. It's important for you to say your name properly because a lot is in a name. People didn't just give you a name. They thought of it, they prayed over it, they wanted it to be said and spelled a certain way. Respect that. My name is Roidi Ruben Njeraro. So I've taken the opportunity where people have mispronounced my name to first correct them and then secondly to share and teach them the importance of those names and the significance of the person who gave me that name. It's been a great opportunity to connect with people and to share my story through my name. Hi, my name is Sarah and while my name might be easy to pronounce, it's important that all names are given the same amount of effort and respect. Most of my patients or my colleagues call me Dr. Russum or Dr. Russum. That's not my name. In my culture, my last name comes from my grandfather, and his name was Russum. So I am Dr. Russum. Growing up in the 80s, I just wanted to fit in. But as I grew up, I found out my passions were creating change and fighting for justice and celebrating diversity. My name, which means create, fits my identity just perfectly. My name is Rechna Kure. Adopting a Western name did make my life easier because I became more convenient to my friends and my peers, classmates, and teachers. But if you really think about why I underwent so many name transitions and truly for whose benefit it was, it certainly wasn't all about me. I'm proudly speaking my name today. My name is Kim Myung Hua. Hi, my name is Janae, and I encourage you all to own your name, own the beauty of it, and encourage others to do the same. If someone mispronounces your name, let them know. I don't really think of my name as being mispronounced often, but it is, uh, even in my head, I think it was Michael Hernandez instead of Hernandez, just because I've heard people pronounce it that way. I learned about my family history and the legacy and what it meant to be a who in our family. And I became really proud to be Lydia Who, so much so that I couldn't bear the thought of changing my name even when I got married. It's so much a part of my identity, Lydia Who. It's special, it's unique, it's who I am, you might say. So all of this to say, if your name is special and unique and different, don't be shy to ask people to pronounce it correctly. Hi, my name is not hard to pronounce, it's Leslie Thatcher, but for many people, their names may not be familiar, they may look difficult to pronounce, but their names are their names and we all need to work hard to make sure we are respecting everybody's preference and their identity and the meaning that their names bring to their lives, to their identity, and to their place in this world. My name is Marissa. It's the name my parents gave me in love and it's the name I respond to. Now more than ever, it's important to say someone's name correctly and say it properly. It's a sign of recognition, a sign of acknowledgement, and a sign of respect. Hi, my name is Laura Pejas. I do not want to be rejected. I do not want those people to not remember my name. I've come to realize that it's important that everyone speaks their own name. Hi, my name is Kate Cadillac, spoken but not spelled like the car. Our names are one of the most basic parts of our identity. And our name, which is so uniquely tied to their identity, deserves to be said proudly and properly. My name is Hitho Johnny. Here today, reintroducing myself as Huynh Jun, because that is my name, that is who I am, and I am proud of it. And that's not how you pronounce my name. My name is pronounced Fabio. Hello, my name is Dina Sayavedra. Immediately correct them, of course, with respect, with love. And um, I am very, very proud of my name and the way it is spelled. I love it because it's very unique. Now, I tell you, be proud of your name. Own it. Love it. My name 
is Damir Kriljevic. And I strongly believe that it is important for people to make an enthusiastic effort in learning the pronunciation of names that are considered uncommon or non-traditional in this country. My name is David Shapiro. We speak each other's names and we listen to how they're pronounced. It's a way to honor our heritage, honor where we came from, honor the stories that brought us to this country. Hi, my name's Ed Bianchi. Your names are the first and most important gift that we're ever given and they should be celebrated by everyone. Hello, my name is Veronica Puga. And hopefully we can all uh, try to pronounce everybody's name. Uh, Speak everybody's name the way that it is and not try to change it. My name is Eva Schwanchadley. I really appreciated every single person who took the time to learn how to say it correctly. A person's name is so important to who they are that I think it's really important for each of us to pronounce a person's name the way it should be. In my country of Eritrea, we traditionally take our father's first name as our last name. And he takes pride in his name. So I take pride in pronouncing my name as Amanda Bahlibi. My name is Justin Gardner. And although my name isn't as difficult to pronounce, it is so critical for everyone to make the effort to pronounce their names. Hi, my name is Alan. And while my name is not so difficult to pronounce, it is important to me that others make an effort in pronouncing your name the way it should be. We all deserve to have our names spoken correctly. Without that, who knows who you could be talking to. Hi everyone, I'm State Senator Alessandra Biaggi and I am here. But as an adult now, I find that I am not only proud of my name, but that I have been become more comfortable correcting people who mispronounce it or misspell it. My name is Daisha, so though not difficult to pronounce, could be read in so many different ways. It is critical for everyone to make the effort in pronouncing your name as it should be. My name is Rochelle Williams. I go by Shelly because it's easier, but really it is critical for everyone to make the effort in pronouncing names as they should be. Every name is important in its own right. My name is Isabel. Hi all, my name is Kenita Ballard and I'm here to tell you the story of my name. So my name is fairly simple. It is a name that was created to let people know who I am when they first see my name because my name is written, it's, it's spelled phonetically. Um, yet I've gotten everything from underneath the sun from Kenita um, to Kenitra. Um, people keep on trying to add letters um, even though that's not what my name is for. That's not who I am. You can't add things to who I already am. You can't add things to my name. Um, so even though I've had this very, very simplistic name, 
the the origins of my name are complex um, because uh, I am named after my father. Um, my father is Kenneth Lynn Ballard. I am Kenita Lynn Ballard. So to me, it's not just a mispronunciation of my name. It's 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 a slight, it's an offense to my family, to my origin stories. So when people mispronounce my name, I make sure to tell them right then and there. It's Kenita Lynn Ballard. And that is the story of my name. Hello all, um, I'm Kanita Ballard. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so to get things started, um, I will be sharing a poem that I wrote um, called Is um, by me, Kanita Ballard, uh, as you just all heard. My name is not your struggle to pronounce. My name is not a series of questions for you to Christopher Columbus your way into who I am. I will only tell you these two things because my name is worth so much more than what it is not. My name is both a memory and a gift from the mouth of my mothers and my fathers. A gift from the grounds my ancestors first walked, ran one foot in front of the other. To bring this, this linguistic expression of connection to my past of who I will be and who I am, my name is, my name is my name. Learn it, feel it, hear it. My name is a stitch in a tapestry rich with such sight and sounds hidden between syllables and vowels. It is a story, one page, one chapter, one book that has one word, and that is my name. My name is, my name is, my name is. And that is Is by, again, Kanita Ballard. I thank you all for this opportunity to uh, let me share my story and let me share my thoughts and reflections um, in regards to why being yourself, why being and living your name is so important. Um, and I look forward to the thoughts and reflections of others. Thank you all so much. Hi everyone, and welcome to the Speaking My Name Summit. I'd like to start by shedding some light on a few hashtags you may have seen trending on social media. Say her name, say his name, and say their name. If we start to learn to respect someone from the beginning by asking them how to say their name and working to acknowledge them in those first few moments, we can work towards living in a world where we no longer have to use hashtags in order to acknowledge someone once they have passed. I'd like to take a moment of silence to acknowledge the injustice and racism that exist. We continue to use the hashtag speaking my name so that we can unlearn assumptions and bias to get to the world. My name is Yorit Haile. And now I'll pass you over to my fellow campaign co-lead, Petal Johnny. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Yorit. It is true. We had started the hashtag Speaking My Name campaign in April after I had corrected how my name was introduced on a panel talking about culturally responsive education for school counselors to support our most vulnerable students when they go back to school amidst the coronavirus pandemic. Given the topic, I thought correcting the proper pronunciation of my name only made sense to do. And that's where I met now campaign co-lead Quinn Jun, 
who told me she had never corrected people when they called her by her last name, completely disregarding her first name, and how she has not experienced the joy her parents would feel in hearing her name said proudly and properly in public. That's when I realized the panel we were on discussing how educators can be culturally responsive needed to take a huge step back and first talk about something as simple as a name. Since then, it has been a conscious decision to continue the campaign because of the persistent injustice we see in our society. Speak Mentorship serves youth and educators, and we knew we could use our platform and voice to begin to amplify the many minority voices who something as simple as their name, begin to teach the importance in educators and youth being culturally responsive and making space for a student's identity without placing our own biases and labels onto them. This is not where the work stops. Racism exists and Black lives not only matter, but they must also thrive. Through this campaign and our SPEAK programs that develop our marginalized and vulnerable youth by connecting them to strong and visible representations of success, people who look like them, we are working to dismantle the systems upholding injustice. I learned that the history we were taught in grade school was not my only history, and I understood that when my teachers consistently mispronounced my name, excluding half of my identity. To the educators watching, be critical of what you teach. Be critical of who you're teaching it to. There is more work to be done, more than the work of Speak Mentorship alone and the hashtag Speaking My Name campaign. We must invest funds into our families, educators, healthcare providers, so they are armed with the resources they need more than we are arming our law enforcement. We have seen the inequities in our communities through both pandemics our society is currently facing. Redirecting funds towards community needs such as jobs, healthcare, education, housing, food security, restorative practices will help heal society so that much of law enforcement becomes redundant. Call your representatives about things that matter to you. Complete the census. Organize and inform your community. Vote. Run for office. However you enact change, enact change, because it is up to you. I want to thank my two co-leads, Yodi Taile and Quinn Junbo, for their commitment to this campaign, our volunteers, our campaign contributors for sharing their name videos, and our many sponsors who have helped communicate the message of the hashtag Speaking My Name campaign, Women's Activism NYC, NYC Department of Records and Information Systems, Name Coach, Ruksha, New Leaders Council, South Asian Network, Mentor, Multiplying Good, Daya, to the Queens and Angelica Acevedo for writing about the hashtag Speaking My Name campaign, and L'Oreal for the donations we received for our mentors and now our graduates. Thank you to our hardworking and dedicated community of SPEAK mentors who support our mentees' development. These mentees graduating today have worked so hard over this past year to learn and grow as independent and critical thinkers. Not everyone is ready to put in the work that challenges them and forces them to persist as leaders of our society. These young people have. Please take a moment to celebrate them on this graduation from the SPEAK Mentorship Foundational Year and as they continue on through our alumni programming. First up, our Ambassador of the Year for her extraordinary leadership and commitment to her own self-development as well as the development of her peers. Mapuja Khatun, Speak Alum and Ambassador of the Year. Our Rising Leader Award, an ambassador who has shown immense promise as developing leader. Irene Almonte, Speak Alum and Rising Leader. Our Mentee of the Year, for her consistent dedication to her own growth and development. Chloe Navarro, Speak Alum and Mentee of the Year. Our Shooting Star Awards, young people who have challenged themselves and their mentors through thought-provoking and defining conversations that led to growth in both directions and their impact on their community. Gigi Taragori, Speak Alum and Student Star Award recipients. Bianca Peña. Speak Alam and Shooting Star Award recipient. Nafisha Naushin, Speak Alam and Shooting Star Award recipient. And these amazing young people for their grit, determination, focus, and development. Sanjida Chaudhary, Speak Alam. Afrida Ahmed, Speak Alam. 
Nasira Sise, speak alum. Saima Akhtar, speak alum. Sasim Jahan, hi or alum. Chitra Shrikishan, speak alum. Today, we continue with the hashtag speaking my name and this summit now, so we can begin the work of unlearning assumptions and bias and relearning respect so that we can get to the world where we no longer need hashtags in remembrance of a life taken unjustly. Throughout today, please share your name videos and use the hashtag speaking my name. We look forward to hearing how you speak your name. Thank you once again for joining hashtag speaking my name today. My name is Hithil Jani. Thank you to all our Speaking My Name Summit participants. Later today, we'll be joined by Vital Voice Training for a workshop on names, two incredible speakers working on cultural inclusion through our social lives segment. And finally, our youth town hall with our very own Speak Mentees and New York State Senator, Alessandra Biaggi. First, please enjoy what will be an incredibly riveting panel discussion. What's in the name? Hi, everybody. Um, can all the panelists turn on their cameras and unmute themselves? Okay, I think that's everybody. We're good? Yes, we are good. Everybody's here and seeing each other. Um, so um, today's panel um, is about just getting to know what is in a name. And we wanted to we invited a few different guests from all walks of life to discuss what is in the name. So instead of me, traditionally, we would introduce or uh, the moderator would introduce the panelists. But since this is a speaking my name campaign, we want each of the panelists to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with introducing um, and then I'm going to ask the panelists to go in alphabetical order um, to introduce themselves as well, too. So again, my name is Huynh Chun Bo, and I am the moderator and one of the co-leads for the Speaking My Name campaign. My name is Ed Bianchi, and I work with IDEA Public Schools in Texas. Hi, my name is Praveen Schonbog, and I'm the founder and CEO of Name Coach Inc. And Norma, you're up next. Oh. Hi, my name is Norma Vega, and I am the founding principal of Ellis Preparatory Academy in the Bronx. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Roe D. Ruben Giraro, and uh, I oversee the African Collaborative Network in Grand Rapids, Michigan. All right. So thank you for introducing yourselves. So I just wanted to briefly talk about um, what what is like the most common way that people mispronounce your name if that was the case. Um, I know, Ed, your name is the most common, um, and maybe you haven't experienced that, but the other panelists, um, have you experienced that? And what are some of the most common ways that it has been mispronounced? So I'll, start, I'll say that my name seems to be pretty easily uh, to spell or pronounce. It's Norma Vega, but most people pronounce my name as Norman. Um, so somehow I get confused with a, a boy's name or they'll say Vega. And uh, so generally just to make a joke out of it, I'll say it's more like Vega, like Las Vegas without the S. Um, so that's, uh, I make assumptions that my name is pretty easy to spell, but that's not always the case. Well, for me, uh... Sometimes individuals say Ro Heidi and Heidi at the end. Like, um, and then my last name is a bit more challenging for folks because the N and D run together, creating a J. And, and so, yeah, Njiraro. Some people just say Geraro. It's to drop the N and D. Yeah. 
So for me, um, I just recently started going by my real name. Um, people have mispronounced my name um, for over 30 years of my life. And um, people weren't ever really close to ever saying my name correctly, even when I uh, corrected them when I was younger. Um, and some of the names that people used to call me were Teresa, TiVo, Bo, Tron. I even got George and Winnie. So again, none of these names were even close to um, my real name, which is Huen Chun. Um, so thank you for sharing that. So um, I just wanted to know what, if you guys have a story behind your name, if you're willing to share, what does your name mean? And if there's a, a story behind it? Um, Parveen, do you want to go first? Sure, yeah. Um, so my name actually means expert, which is a uh, not necessarily the most humble of names that my parents gave me, but the reality is that I consider myself more a jack of all trades um, than an expert. But uh, I am. I think it's a it's a it's a nice meaning to have. I think reflects their aspirations for me, um, and kind of actually how they raised me to try to to try to excel in, in, in whatever I did. Um, so and and just real quick, I wanted to share that I've also had subtle and not so subtle mispronunciations of my name all my life. Uh, everything from, instead of Praveen, which is my name, everything from Praveen for my first name to Shebang, which is a very not so subtle <laughs> mispronunciation of my last name, Sean Dog. Um, so it's, it's, it's been interesting, but uh, uh, only over the, you know, as I, as I grew up, did I start trying to correct people. John, I think you might be on mute. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll jump in next. If that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I actually uh, I share my name with my father and my son. Um, my full name is Anthony Edward Bianchi. I'm junior. Uh, my son is the third. However. My dad um, goes by Tony from Anthony, and my son goes by Ward, which is the second half of Edward. So for us, I think that sharing the name with my father really, he's someone I look up to, thankfully, um, but it really has kind of been something that I've carried with me as wanting to be a representation of him. Um, but at the same time, one of the things that we always talked about was it would never be Big Tony and Little Tony or Big Ed and Little Ed. We would have our own names within that so that we are establishing our own kind of identities. Um, and, and my last name, Bianchi, um, most folks will give it a Bianchi, um, you know, not too far off, but I did get a Mr. Beyonce one time, which I'm going to be honest, it got hard for me to correct. I was like, ooh. We might go like you might have talked me into something, friend. Um, but yeah, you know, my name again has, has been passed down and, and passed on to my son, and and that really, the character that comes with it, I think, is the one thing that has always stuck with me. Yeah, well, my name uh, Row E D. It's just very phonetically spelled like row, like a row your boat. The letter E. And then D, like someone's name D, so Rui D, and that was given to me by my grandfather. Uh, my on my dad's side, we in my language. Uh, I'm from Chad, Africa, and my language means one who builds a road. So row is road, and then E D is to grow from. So if you cut off a piece of like a branch and it grows, that's E D. So since I'm the firstborn, I'm growing from my father. So my grandfather. Oh, nice. Ruby, yeah, Ruben is uh, my dad's a pastor. Biblical. Um, yeah. yeah, very biblical, uh, son of Leah. So, uh, behold a son since I'm the firstborn son. And then the last name J J is one who builds a row. So, you have row again, and then Jira is to means is to do or to make. And so uh, my grandfather gave that. And so as uh, Gerardos were all building different types of roads and directions um, that were led. 
I think we're having technical difficulties. Can you hear me okay, though? Yes. Great. Uh, Hu and Jen, I think if you maybe log off and come back in, everything should be back to normal. So let's try that. So given that, given the difficulty, and I'll, I will turn on my camera. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, so given uh, the difficulties that you've had with your names, have you ever wanted to change your name, perhaps? Was there ever a moment that you've gone by a different name, made it easier for other people, or just simply want to change your name? I wanted to change my last name I went to when I was younger to uh, uh, Susulu. And that's a that's a South African name, just because it sounded good. But um, directly a question here in the States, no, I've never really had that desire to change my name. You guys hear me that. now? Oh, hey. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about the awkwardness. I was been trying to talk to you guys, um, but I missed the last question. Um, did have to ask if you wanted to change, if anybody on this panel wanted to change your name. Um, and Rowini just uh, explained that you did not. Correct? No, no. Well, one time just to Susulu because I just like how it sounded, and that was more of a South African name. So. <laughs> nice. Uh, I was, was going to say, I'll admit that I, I gave into some peer pressure as a kid. Um, not only did I often wish that I had a, uh, a Western name and wanted to change it, but I'd accept uh, nicknames that, that others gave me. I grew up in, in, in Ohio, uh, so mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of diversity where I was from. Um, and uh, yeah, so for, for a while, I was, I was not terribly happy with the fact that uh, my name was different and that I needed to constantly um, either accept a mispronunciation or, or correct people that change over time, of course. So I was named after my aunt. Um, and in my family, there's always, there, there's certain names, particularly the middle name for men. Um, the middle name for men is Anibal, which means grace, and which I didn't find out so many years later. But for us, you know, we give each other namesakes. So I was named after my aunt. I didn't particularly care for my name initially because I thought it was boring. Um, but I had a great teacher, and one of the things that she did with us was to learn the roots of our names and the meanings of our names. And so I learned that my name was actually a Roman name. Um, and it also meant a model to follow after. And I actually like that, um, especially for somebody who uh, didn't always feel like a model. It was great that through education, I learned what my name meant and I felt really great about it and I wanted to live up to it. Um, and it wasn't a Puerto Rican name and I'm Puerto Rican. Um, but I think that over time, it grew on me and I appreciated it. And I liked the fact that my mom named me Norma because I, I, I felt like I could live up to my name, even though it felt initially kind of boring. So for me, I hated my name growing up. Um, again, it's funny that I hated my name, even though nobody even called me by my name, um, just because of people would just give me nicknames. Um, when I was young, <laughs> a lot of the teachers just told me I wasn't gonna be successful um, in America unless I changed my name. Um, and they told me to either pick, it, pick a name or I'm gonna pick one for you. Um, and that's how I've had so many different names in my life. Um, I've also had um, employees when I interview telling me that I need to change my name as well, too, um, because, again, it's going to be too difficult. Um, so I just kind of accepted that since I was a little kid. And um, the most recent name I felt like that was closest to my identity um, was going by my quote unquote last name, um, which is actually pronounced ball but I just say Vo because that's the American way of saying it. And that was the closest to my name that I can come up with. Um, and then like recently I started going by my real name, but um, I think uh, a lot of the immigrant students could relate to that as well too, um, of having something, I call it my Starbucks name, where I go and I order um, it from like restaurants or drinks. I always give a different name because I know there's no way they're gonna get my real name. So I think my favorite Starbucks name was Batman. And my sister, who also has a difficult name, uh, if we went together, we would go by Robin. So when they call the order, they always say like Batman and Robin. So 
So that was always like a fun way for me just to uh, kind of change my name. But instead of like people changing my name for me, I got to choose. Um, but I'm hoping that um, I will be able just to like, again, I just started reintroducing myself as Huynh Chun. So I'm really hoping that I continue to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm just listening to y'all stories and how you guys are so powerful with like how, how you say your name, how you correct people that I'm hoping that I will be able to do that as well too. Um, so knowing that like um, usually people from, I feel a lot of people from Asia tend to change to a more American name or um, trying to westernize their names to make it easier or more for Americans to be able to say their names. Um, what is y'all's opinions about that? Um, would you recommend that they do or recommend that they don't or somewhere in between? What is your opinion of people changing the name to make it more or what they perceive as making it easier or more convenient to them? That's a hard question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't think you should. I don't think anybody should change their name. Um, I mean, it's just unbelievably disrespectful. Uh, your name is who you are. It's your identity. It's how you get to know somebody, you know, their culture. I mean, their their language, their personality. I mean, everything. I mean, your name tells people who you are. And so it reminds me of, um, you know, times of, when you when people immigrated through and went through Ellis Island and they changed their names because they um to figure out how to say it. And so honestly like it's a lack of interest in that individual if you choose to not want to pronounce their name correctly. And so and if you have a lack of interest in pronouncing my name correctly, then you don't have an interest in me. And Ed, I know that in your name story, you were explaining that your family, um, they couldn't get through Ellis Island, is that correct? And they went through Philly to immigrate over here? Is that not, was that not you? Oh, okay, there was somebody else then. <laughs> I couldn't remember who whose story was that. Um, but I know that a lot of like family names have been changed just like recently, but in the past as well too, um, to make them more quote unquote American. Um, and to be honest, I feel like my life has been made a little bit easier because I went by an easier American name. Um, so I didn't get that bias when people look at like a piece of paper, for example, when they see my name. Um, and I know that we're trying to empower the youth to go like, no, that's not right. And you need to go by your name. But what type of tips and tricks do you have for you to be able to be empowered to not change the name to something that's easier just because it's more convenient to most Americans. So I, I was gonna say I have some thoughts on this. I 100% I agree that, you know, names are central to our identities and, and we should not be volunteering to change them um, just because others have a difficult time uh, or might have a difficult time learning how to say them or might see the name and have some sort of implicit bias against it. Um, you know, why are we volunteering to do the sorts of things that were imposed on us at Ellis Island or, you know, in the past? At, at the same time, uh, and, and we see this a lot with the students we work with and even even with um, some of the companies we work with, it, as you said, there's it becomes a lot easier for people in their lived experiences when they, when they go with the flow, right? The flow being, the older flow of saying, you know what, I, I'm just going to make it easy on, on, on everyone else, um, which is really unfortunate. Uh, and we've seen, uh, there is one story that really stuck out to me. One of the students um, uh, with one of our partners said that they were actually considering whether or not, uh, whether or not they would attend the college, a specific college, uh, as opposed to staying in their home country, um, whether they would come to college in the United States because they were worried that with their name, at least one among many, probably a number of reasons, related reasons. They were worried that with their name, the teachers would not call on them as much, not engage them as much. As much. What's the point then? And 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 that that is studies have shown that that actually happens, um, and it happens in all kinds of areas of life, not just in the classroom. Um, 
uh, studies have also shown, you know, implicit bias when people are looking at um, at resumes, the exact same resume with one name uh, will be get less callbacks than a resume with another name. So it's a, it's a very difficult issue. Um, the way the way I like to think about it is that that just should energize us all the more to really appeal to everybody who's considering changing their name or considering not correcting other people to say, you know what, stand up for yourself, do it anyway. Let's create a sea change in the culture. And I think that sea change has been has been happening, especially over the past, I'd say five to ten years or so. Um, especially with younger generations, they're becoming. Uh, as they should, much more adamant about respect for identity and, and who they are. And I think um, older generations are starting to, to take note of that and realize, you know what, among many other things, something something as critical as just, or as simple as, I'm not gonna change this person's name, I'm gonna take a moment to learn it, um, is becoming uh, more well-recognized as the right thing to do. Yeah, and Norma, I know, <laughs> sorry, I know when we were, can you hear me? Okay, Norma, I know when you were uh, we were talking the other day, you were saying how you were excited to see the change that is happening um, when you were younger to now, um, of how names are just being more accepted and people are, are um, just being more empowered to say what their names are. Um, so could you just kind of explain like what you were seeing back in the day versus what you're seeing now within like the school systems? Yes. Um I'll be dating myself. Um, so as we were speaking yesterday, I graduated high school in 1989. And, um, and it was really different during that time. Um, and I was recollecting a particular sh uh, television show, not that I watched it, but I just remember. And he was a talk, uh, talk show host and his name was, his real name was Geraldo Rivera. But he actually started the Jerry Rivers show and the Jerry Rivers show, which I think was the in the 90s. The reason he did it is because his last name would not attract as many people to his show than to say Jerry Rivers. And honestly, because he could pass for a lot, he could pass for somebody who was Caucasian. I didn't know until later that he was actually Spanish. Um, on the news, but when it became a little more acceptable, right, probably in the mid 90s, later, you know, later 90s, to like use your last name and it became marketable, then it was the Geraldo Rivera show. Um, and so, what I appreciate most is the trends and the changes, and how 20 years later we're back at the same conversation, and I feel that it's gone a little deeper. And so I guess that's a good thing about living long enough to see trends um, and that you could appreciate it and say, and look back, wow, 20 years ago, this is what was happening when I was in high school. Wow, I'm living it again now with a younger generation and who have a different spirit, a different passion, and they're taking it you know, to the next level. So I'm excited you know, for my kids, you know, like my children are young, so, um, you know, 20 years from now, when my daughter's 29 and my son is 30, you know, they'll pick up the, they'll pick up the baton and then take it yet to another level. And I just, I love to be able to see, I appreciate that process. Like I see it in my students. Um, I've seen it in my own children. And, and I, that's something that we need to embrace that change one isn't happen quickly. Um, and that it goes over time and that where we're at now in this moment in time, even though there, there are tragedies and things that have happened, which are, ter are terrible, but there's something about now that really started years ago. And now there's a moment, a window of opportunity where all things are in place that allow for what needed to happen 20 years ago to finally happen now. And that is what's exciting to be able to be a part of that. The fine, finally, you know, like everything is in place for something great to happen, a change, a great change, you know, to happen. Can I can I add to that? I, I you know, as far as um, especially for young people, understand your name anchors people, right? Because I grew up 
I came to the States when I was four. We fled a civil war in Chad in 79, came to the States. That was my first introduction uh, back in 82. So um, at home, my parents said my name. They say Roe D more often, uh, all the time. They spoke our tribal language at home. So when we eventually moved back in middle school, I was angry. And I realized that once I began to understand my name and knew the meaning of my name, it really anchored me to my history and roots. I think to no much point, I think sometimes this generation gets lost because there's, there's no anchor. And maybe and when they begin to understand the name and what they mean and the significance of the name, then I think you, you, you're able to find your way in this difficult time because you can say, hey, these are, these are the names that were given to me for an aspiration, for a hope. This is where I come from. And it's so, you know, as I've gotten older, I appreciate that because once I really began to understand the meaning of my names and to be able to trace my history, that's the fortunate I would say privilege or thing that I have that I can actually trace who my grandparents are back further and my great grandparents has really given me uh, an opportunity to navigate and to look forward into things. So yeah, I don't, I, with the students and people I work with, I say, you say your name proudly and that's why I love being invited and you say bold and you make people say your name because that's the expectation from them as well. And I think what the society as the U.S. has is that if you're going to invite in immigrants and say, hey, you're welcome, guess right. what? They're going to bring in their names That's and right. they're going to bring in cultures. And so you got to be ready to engage with that. You can't articulate that premise and then somewhere down the road begin to now navigate and dictate how things are going to be done. Right. I agree. Well said. <laughs> Beautifully said. <laughs> and to, to kind of I guess to even to add a layer, just thinking about how, you know, now you have so many um, folks that are seeking to be allies in this work, right? And trying to be allies in this work. And I think one of the simple answers to, and the question always comes up, you know, what can I do? Okay, you should know by now. But anyways, I think one of the simple answers is, you know, the first thing you can do is to say somebody's name and say it with the pride that they have, right? And so thinking about, you know, kind of in communities where where more names are simple to pronounce, um, but but spreading this as, as kind of one of the main pillars of the diversity, equity, and inclusion work that we all think we're doing by doing a, a book club. Um, so, you know, really making sure that this is at the forefront of, of all of those trainings, I think is such a simple thing to do. But like you guys said, so powerful um, because it is honoring a history um, and a family and a culture, all just by saying three syllables correctly. Yeah, and I think just the, sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback on my end when I talk, but um, one of the simplest ways, I guess, that people can change how they can ask the question is instead of saying, do you have another name you go by? Just asking, well, how do you pronounce your name? Um, and every time I've experienced the how do you pronounce your name, I automatically felt more welcome and more valued uh -huh. than somebody just going, what's a nickname that you go by? Can I call you by a different name? Because automatically, like, you don't even know me and you're you're just kind of making me feel invisible. Um, but I, I Roe D, I wish that I had somebody like you when I was younger to say, no, just speak up for yourself and, like, say your name because that's what it is and that's who you are. Um, I know when I was younger, I didn't really understand the meaning, sorry, the meaning of my name. Um, because my parents, they had four other children with different names, and I guess we just never questioned what our names were. So I would write it differently every single time uh, because I thought it didn't mean anything. The teachers just call me whatever. And my teachers knew if I just wrote anything on the paper, that was me uh, because I would just write a different name. And um, until I learned what my story was, I was named after a Vietnamese princess. Um, that's when I became more proud of writing my name. And that was a small step that I could claim my name um, and choose when I wanted to use it. Um, so I think you're right, like having that anchor and understanding what is your name story can bring a lot of power to your name. Um, so I know um, we kind of touched on this about it a little bit, um, but I know most of the panelists are educators. What are some things that you can tell the youth to be able to do to stand up to the teachers or stand up to their their peers or other leaders in their life 
um, when they already feel so small, um, just to say like, I you I want my name to uh, be spoken correctly, or what are some tools that you think teachers could have to be able to um, feel more comfortable uh, speaking other students' names or speaking their students' names? So I know, um, sorry, this, if we, I don't even know if you guys can really hear me or my question. Yes, but we can hear you. Um, yeah. So, so I, I'll go. I, I, what I will say is that I love my kids. I, I've been working with young people, at least in the DOE, for 23 years. I love my young people. Um, I've been working with immigrant youth since uh, 2000 until now. and. New Americans, amazing, brilliant. Like, I just love my kids. And I have no tolerance for anybody ever seeing them as what they really are, which is phenomenal. Um, I have kids who come from all over the place. And, um, and I've had children from Chad. I've had, I have a girl from Vietnam. I have a girl from, um, I think, I, no, I'm not going to make assumptions for Praveen, but I do have children from Yemen, from Yemen, from Bangladesh. Um, I have kids from all over the world. And one thing that has always infuriated me is how, because they speak a different language and because they come older to this country, because my school is a school for student, kid, young, older uh, immigrants, nobody wants them because they're too hard. They're too complicated. Um, how am I supposed to teach a kid English who doesn't even have the same alphabet? I mean, there's all sorts of rationales why you wouldn't want to teach kids. I mean, you know, unfortunately, as humanity, we go and we default to what's easier. But these are phenomenal kids. And I constantly, constantly tell them that they are valued, that they are important, that above all, they are an asset to any community that they walk into that they're never to think of themselves as less than when they speak eight different languages. I get angry with them and I tell them, how dare you not let people know that you speak a different language? How dare you not share your story with them and let them know what you struggle with, what you've overcome, the thousands of miles that you've traveled? How dare you? You have a story, you have a responsibility to share that story because there'll be other young people who will need those stories. And I don't have them change their names, I refuse to. Some of them might say, well, miss, you can call me this. And I'm like, no, miss, I'm not going to call you that. You know, you tell me how you say your name. And if I say it wrong and you correct me, um, like that's just the way I am with my young people. And I think that that's how people should be with their young people. You know, kind of the way I was raised, firm, fair, loving, you know, you don't let them get away with less than. You ensure that they go for more than. Um, and, and that goes for their name. Like, I'm not going to have anybody, I would never accept that. That's a non-negotiable. Can I add one point to that? I want to take the day. I think, and that's great, and, and we need to continue that. Would you find, and this question, you know, with immigrant families coming in, you know, we're taught really the majority of the world to be respectful and humble, right? And so you come into a, a culture that's really about being boisterous and confident. And so you have to teach individuals that type of, of change now where, where, you know, I need to be bold. And then that even starts with the home. I, again, like I was very fortunate at home, my parents did not speak English. They refused. They spoke our tribal language because they knew out the door would learn English all day. And they spoke our, our name. So that really built the confidence at home to allow us to do that in school. So I hear, I love how you talk about working with those students to try to make, build that confidence because they're coming from cultures. I really, you know, know I need to be humble. And with certain things, you need to be taught to be bold. With. Yeah, I don't think they won't look at me in the face. Yeah. They won't. Look at me <laughs> I know that too, yeah. They won't. They're not allowed. They're not allowed to look at me in the face, and I have to give them permission. And mm -hmm. that's something that's also that's really important. Like, you know, I agree that we have, you know, like they come, are, 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 and so did I. You come from an authoritarian, you know, background. The elders are the elders. Your parents are your parents, and you better not talk back to them. You better not be disrespectful. You don't look at them in the eye. I get that. I, I get that, and I had, a, I had a phenomenal mom, really, you know, far from provincial. But even with that, it, were, it was a clear hierarchy. Who was in charge? And it wasn't me. And so it's really the same in school. Like, who's in charge? I am, right? 
So one of the first things that I allow them to do is I allow them to call me by my first name. And then I let them uh, show respect when they say Miss Norma, right? Because they're not comfortable saying Norma, right? So they say Miss Norma. That's how I start. I'm like, you can call me Miss Norma. And I leave my doors open all the time. You walk in here whenever you want to have a conversation. You walk into my office whenever you feel like you need something. All the doors are open. Um, and so, like, creating an environment where they feel safe and they could start, you know, piloting all sorts of voices. And I have, you know, there's a few who are on this list that I know have done all sorts of things in school, you know, because a lot, of, uh, quite a few of these are my students. And so the things that they've done in school have been phenomenal. And, and that's how it starts. You create a, a place with you. You start with yourself. You make yourself vulnerable. I'm not your principal. I'm not the authoritarian. I'm somebody here who's here to help you. And I, by grace, I was able to have this opportunity. And I think that that's really important that anybody in authority, you know, allow themselves to be vulnerable with their youth. And, you know, and understand that for the time, you're a steward of a school and you're given the privilege to be able to teach these kids. And so whoever is in a position to help other people, it's for a time and it's a privilege. And what do you do with that? And, but I love my kids. They're just wonderful, wonderful. And I wholeheartedly agree with you because they, they do need to be taught to get a voice of their own because they, they won't do it. Well, Ms. Norma, I think one of the things you said, a small thing that you said, but it's, when you talk to the students, if I say your name incorrectly, you correct me, right? So giving them that power to correct you, right? And you're, you know, you're seeing, you want to talk about hierarchy. I mean, you're the principal, you're way up here, but that I think is, like you said, it adds such humility, but allows them to have power to really claim to somebody who's way up. And, and I think that is just a, hopefully that's something that makes it second nature for them as they they engage you know other folks so i i think that's just such a simple um but important important step for sure and thank you for all you're doing i like i i want to send my son to school it's a two and a half hour train ride from where i live but he might be coming i don't know we're gonna figure this out man <laughs> come <and> visit <laughs> yeah like like when, when john said i wish i had an educator like you when i was a kid <laughs> it's it's really awesome uh how how much you're focused on empowering the students and the way that you're doing that. I think that's, that is absolutely critical to the, you know, even the previous question around um, what do you say to students who are, who want to change their name coming into the country, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think to the extent that we can empower uh, kids in all sorts of ways, including speaking up for themselves when their names get mispronounced to, you know, positions of authority is, is a critical component of that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I guess, you know, to the question of tools, I, of course, have a biased response, which is to the tools that I built to help with this. Uh, but part of the, you know, in, in brief, we provide audio pronunciation buttons into systems so people can learn how to say names. Part of the inspiration for that was my sister getting her name mangled and me getting my name mangled. And also as an educator for the brief time I was, about seven years, uh, doing that to a number of my students, um, college students. But um uh, and part of the thought there was that it's also uh, helpful to ensure that when students, you know, don't feel that they're in an environment of safety, that we take the burden off them. And then on the flip side, uh, for educators or really for anyone who don't feel as we do about the importance of it, or at least not yet, of getting the name right, uh, making it easier for them, right? Kind of bringing non-name users to become name name users is the way, the way I like to think about it. Um, but that's just one thing among many, many things that, that we can do, both in particular for names, but also in general, as you said, to sort of empower students to find their voice. Yeah, um, and I love your, your tool. Um, I wish I had that such a long time ago. Um, I had a few colleagues that have um, that I've been emailing back and forth with, and they, they just are, I didn't even say anything about the tool, I just kind of, embedded that in the email and they were like, wow, I like how I can just like practice hearing your name so then I can say it correctly when I see you in person so they can have time to practice this themselves. Cause I know like I get nervous when I see a name that isn't so common and I don't want to mess it up because I know how much 
I hate it when people mess up my name. So I love that you have a very simple tool um, that's just embedded in the email. It's not in your face. Um, and people can practice as much as they, they need to. Um, and something that, um, as an educator, I hope other teachers stay here as well, too, um, to practice your students' names before something as important as graduation happens. Um, because, you know, graduation is a time of celebration. And I remembered um, I, I graduated four times, and every single time my name was messed up. And the only time that my uh, my professors or teachers even attempted to say my name was when they gave me a little index card and said, write your name phonetically. And I remember the first time I was given that little piece of paper, I just looked at it and I was like, I don't know how to write my name phonetically. What does that even mean? Um, and they only handed it to the students. They said, if you think you have a difficult name, raise your hand and we'll give you an index card. So they didn't even like I, I don't know that it was just I, I went to a high school with a lot of a lot of students um, as well as college. Um, and I'm hoping that if you are going to ask a student to write their name phonetically, teach them how to do that before an important day like graduation, where you have to just sit there with your little pencil and try your hardest. Um, and even with the phonetic spelling, go up to that student and ask them, I want to make sure that I'm saying your name correctly. Um, because none of my teachers did that, and they still messed up my name, even though I spelt it out phonetically for them. Um, so I'm just hoping that any educators um, who are listening, that they hear that, that you need to practice and actually value the person instead of just for the student practice um, when you're supposed to try to say their name. So like practice way beforehand and value the person like way beforehand than just when you're announcing their names. Um, and I'm really hoping um, I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm going back to school, so I'm really hoping that the next time I graduate, this will be my fifth time. That I'm hoping that the fifth time will be um, correct. So cross your fingers. <laughs> so, yeah. I have a question, and I, just real quickly to to add to, to all the panelists. I don't want to take over role, but I was just thinking as no one was speaking. You know, you work with a lot of immigrant children and and people who speak seven eight languages, and this is my assessment. I just question if you find that. The more languages you know, you're basically a linguistic, you know, so you're able to learn other languages and figure out people's names for other countries where most Americans, you just speak English. And so it's really difficult to begin to train your mind to really understand how languages and words are broken up. Because I have a sister too, she speaks eight languages. Wow. And so she's able to pick up, but she went home when she was a baby. So she was born here, but grew up in Africa. So she learned Gambai and then all her friends' languages. And she's kind of, um, part is a gift, but it's just that scenario. And so do you find where maybe immigrant uh, students are able to learn each other's names a lot yeah. easier than just your <laughs> three American students who grew yes. up here? Yeah. As a matter of fact, my Yemeni students uh, pick up Spanish very quickly. Yeah. Very, very quickly. Our French students pick up uh, Spanish very quickly. So awesome. I find I find that integration. I mean, our, predominantly my African and my Middle Eastern um, populations, they pick up the other languages really fast. Mm. And um, so it's really funny sometimes. I'm walking. I have a large group of Yemeni boys who are really sweet, and they'll teach me. Like I'll say pantalon, pantalon, right? Which means mm. pants, pantalon. And he said, Miss, we say pantalon. That's my word. I said, well, do you remember the history of the Moors and how they conquered Spain and how all of those languages came together? I said, so we have words, you know, that we, that, mm -hmm. that ended up in Arabic because there were wars, there was integration, you know, so if you think about it or, our foods, you know, everything, our, our music, especially as a Hispanic, well, where does it come from? You know, it comes from Africa, you know, predominantly. Like I think about all the things that I love to eat and when my African students come and they bring all that food, I'm like, oh my goodness, I eat the same thing when we have our international festivals. And so it's wonderful to, to celebrate together because we see so many similarities. Um, 
and 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 that helps that really helps for kids to feel at home and go oh i'm not that different oh you know what wait you eat that i eat that oh you listen to that music i listen to that music you know you hear the roots and the drums i'm like where does that come from you know like it comes from africa we know that's where it comes from and so many different things that come from different places and i think just the more we do that and are willing honestly like i think that we just need to be willing um to to just try just just try it you know um, it's kind of like the book that i read my kids green eggs and ham sam i am sam i am just try it and um i love this persistence and i think we need to be like that just try it, you see, you know, it'll be a good thing. Yeah, I think um, the willingness to try as well as the exposure, um, because I know um, people always give an excuse to me that, well, I was born in America. And I go, well, I was too. So I don't know um, what you're trying to say. But they're saying, um, well, I was born in America. I only speak English. So it was really difficult for me to say anything that's not American. But then you have television shows like I'm just thinking Game of Thrones, Harry Potter that have difficult names to say and they can all say it. So it's not the that they can't say it is I feel like, again, it's the willingness as well as the exposure um, to be able to say the name. Because um, I know if I ask anybody uh, to say like Targaryen, they can say it correctly, no matter what language they speak, um, just because there was more exposure and they were more willing to, to do that. Um, so I, I think that's a, an important thing um, for anybody who isn't going by their real name yet or correcting somebody, just the more that you do it and the more you expose people to it, the more easy it is for them to be able to pronounce your name. Um, I think when I first started going by my name, which was only a few months ago, um, I, I didn't know how to explain it to people. Um, and then we came up with this whole speaking my name campaign thing um, and I show them the video instead so that way again they have a, a, a way to practice on their own so they don't also feel embarrassed because I feel like sometimes when um, they don't have the, like people who don't have the tools they feel nervous and they don't want to speak your name um, and I noticed when I first started going by my name in meetings people weren't calling on me and people called on me all the time before and until they started, I just kept resending out my videos um, and I started incorporating the name badge. Then people were starting to call me again and using my name during meetings. But at first, for the first few weeks, I didn't get called on at all. Uh, and I was very like shocked and kind of sad because I, I was just thinking, well, maybe I just go back to an easier name again to make it more convenient for people. But um, I, I remembered I was part of this campaign. I was like, no, I can't be a hypocrite. I need to stand up for myself and do it. So then um, I just practice and practice. And then now people have been practicing and just more easily able to say my name. Um, and I feel like that's uh, similar to a lot of people's stories when they're transitioning from school into the corporate setting. Um, they might not feel as empowered because they're worried about their job and even just job opportunities because of their name. So I'm just wondering, um, what is everybody's opinion on how a name might hinder a job opportunity or just being able to secure a job or just building a career? And I'm also wondering how has um, your cultural diversity played a part in your career? Does anybody want to go first? So for me personally, um, I work in the special ed field. Um, I used to work in a very diverse area in Virginia and I, curr um, I currently live in the greater Boston area. It's not very diverse at all. Um, and I know when my application got sent in, they were worried that I wasn't, um, I, that I didn't speak English. And that was one of the first questions they asked me um, was if I'm an American citizen and if I speak English. And I thought, um, I, I've been asked the question on, I would say most, if not all of my interviews, just because of my name. And I kind of get disheartened because they don't even meet me it, um, and even talk to me before they just assume I don't know English. Um, and 
I asked my coworkers recently because I, I never thought to ask anybody. I said, when they interview you, did they ask you if you know how to speak English? And of course, all my coworkers say, no, they're allowed to do that. I'm like, I don't think they are allowed to do that. But everybody who's ever interviewed me has asked me that. Um, and I know that in my field, um, we because it's special ed, it's that, that's a different diversity culture that we're trying to advocate for. Um, so we kind of hide the teacher's diversity and we tried to not, because most of the teachers are, um, I would consider uh, more Caucasian than any other race, that, um, they don't really try to expose their students to so much culture. Um, and I um, think that has kind of impacted our field. And I think conversations have been coming up recently about how we need to do a better job. Uh, because I work with students who are blind and visually impaired. And one of the main things that when people talk about culture and race is the color of your skin. And people have talked about, well, if you can't see color, then that's great. Then they can't be racist and we don't have to talk about it. Um, and I feel like most of my teachers, that was their belief. But my belief, because I come from a different background, was no, you need to know people's cultures. You need to know about um, like race and color of your skin. And you can't just assume that everybody's purple and pink, right? Um, you have to know and you have to know why people are treated dif differently and why that's important. And um, that has to do, and also with like different names as well too, because you might not be able to see the person, but you might um, like just hearing a name and knowing that they come from a different culture is, is impactful. And a lot of the, my um, colleagues currently did not really understand that until um, just the recent tragic acts where they're feeling like they need to step up and do a better job at educating. And I feel that as a teacher, one of the easiest things to teach right now is just saying, how do you pronounce your name um, and practice and having the students practice that um, and understanding those don't automatically just assume that they have a different name and they can't speak English or they they're not from your your country. Um, like ask those ask questions and get to know the person before just making those um, assumptions. I think that's super important. So I'm just wondering how um, everybody else's career, how has like their their background, their culture, has it or has it not impacted how, um, the position that you have now? Um, and yes. Yeah. It's deep. <laughs> I, you know, I'll say for for me, I you know, I haven't experienced that, right? But having worked in college admissions for a while, you are doing, you know, a colorblind test, right? I mean, you're, you have paper in front of you. You don't have a person in front of you. Um, and so, you know, there are assumptions made by a name, right? Uh, you know, the, and, and there's a lot of training that's going on, but there are still people that don't get it that will, you know, there was nothing more frustrating than being in an admissions meeting with with educated professionals, you know, everybody with an average of two degrees sitting around a table and we refer to someone as piano boy because that's what stuck out. Like, oh, he's a great piano player, not his name because his name wasn't James or John or Jim. And so it that I think is where... Um, where there's so much training and, and so much that's ne that needs to be done in, in the systems in which we operate. But then it also just it. I think the conversation about, you know, how do we encourage students and empower students? It's having seen the other side and seeing that there are people making these decisions that are not ready for that. Like it just it, it just I don't know. It, it makes my head spin. Um, but, you know, it is it, it does happen on the other side and it's it's not OK. Um, but I've, you know, I've, I've been in those conversations and it's, it's, it's again, I, you know, I don't know what else to say, but it, it, it happens and it's not okay. And there, you know, I'm glad that there are places that are doing more work to um, change that and to make sure that we are honoring culture from the jump, from the, from the get go, from the first time we see the first line of a student's college application. Um, and not just because we read something interesting that they wrote us. I think that's super interesting. Ed. I, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's undeniable that um, 
that there's assumptions that are made based on just how a name is written in in recruiting and application processes, both in education and you know in, in the workforce. And um, you know, one one interesting thing I, I won't speak from my personal experience, but more just sort of from the experience of working with organizations and the research that we've seen uh, on this. Um, you know, there's a there's a uh, paper that came out of the Department of Anthropology at University of Western Ontario that looked specifically at the impact of names, um, not just in the recruiting process, but once someone is at the workplace and, and what that means to them. Um, and the point you made when John about, uh, you know, people maybe not speaking up as much is it's, it's spot on. It turns out that especially in situations where there are already power differentials, you know, um, in terms of in management structures, but also in terms of race. Uh, and ethnicity, people are, are very reluctant to correct others on their team. And they're acutely aware that they're not getting called on, they're not getting interacted with as much. One interesting anecdote that I that always stuck with me from that ar arena was um, uh, with actually the State Department and how dele like we were told that delegations were actually s choosing who they would call on from other delegations to discuss a matter often based on whether they thought they could pronounce their name and avoid the embarrassment of messing it up, right? So like it, it goes deep in terms of like how it affects actual um, uh, workplace interactions. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a challenging problem. Well, uh, I wanted to um, just ask one more question um, and kind of like our wrap up question. Do you guys have any final takeaways of what is in a name? I would, I would like to just hear one or two just summary thoughts from each of you of what do you think, like what is in a name and why is it important? I would say to say, I think, again, referring to my own personal history is because I know the significance of my name, it's really allowed me to really anchor in moments of, you know, confusion. And of course I went through, you know, being young, uh, when I was a kid, I, I went by Ruben a lot, but to get home, my, my parents continue to identify or call me by Roe D. Gushin, you know, as I get older, I see the importance of him. So even in, I introduced myself as, as Roe D uh, more often, uh, what I've found is that uh, as, um, as the generations has changed who are more willing to to accept and hear that which then allows me to tell the stories and when people and people hear that i think it's they're interested to know uh when you tell their history and what your name means and your journey um i found that it's, it's a way to, to connect with people that's really important um even go giving you know as uh, i have a daughter and it was important that I also gave her a name that was significant. And even she's three and then teach her where their name is. So my daughter's name is Ronaya. So we took the word Ro in Gumbai, which means road, and then Naya, which is Swahili for purpose. So it's now road with a purpose, right? So that's something go by. And then I gave her uh, a traditional uh, uh, Gumbai name from my home country, which is Nepi Dumbai. And Nepi Dumbai means something for we to praise the Lord about, right? Wow. And then, so even now, I was able to hear it and understand. I said, this is what your name means, and this is a purpose and reason we gave it to you. So I think as, because one thing in the U.S. that's very, that I know is that this culture can engulf you and slowly push away your traditions and your culture, regardless of the saying we want to be open to folks. So it's incumbent upon me to make sure that I put back uh, right. and, as to that, and even work with immigrants and, and, and as they're getting first, second generation, I said, you guys need to, to keep as much as possible. And one way to do that is to make sure their names are known. No. Love that. Does anybody else have some final thoughts? So I, I would like to add to that. I agree that we, there's so much in your name. And likewise, when I have my children you know, my son's uh, name is Gabriel, um, which means uh, messenger of God. And his middle name is Aniba, like all of the other grandfathers, which means grace. And so it's a, he's the bearer of the grace of God. And 
So to me, that's important. And, and why, you know, when you name your children or you, you know, you, you identify or you recognize a name, you're, you know, you're really in tune with who that person is and everything that they represent, that their past, their present, you know, how you're speaking to them and you're speaking into them and to their future. Like, it's really important, that name. And likewise, my daughter's name is Victoria for victory. I'm like, I, I refuse to give her a weak name and her middle name means enlightenment, Erin. So like, it's really, really important that one, they don't shorten their names. That's why I don't believe in nicknames. It's like, you make sure you say your whole name. Oh, and why I won't give my students nicknames um, because I want to know the whole you. And, you, and it starts with your name um, and why it's it's so important to, to know your kids and why the teachers, like one of the first things with my teachers, I'm like, you need to tell me who your kids' names are. You have the month of September to tell me who your kids' names are. What are their names? If you don't know their names, you can't teach them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's very important. Reedy and Norma, I, I love the thought and significance you put into how how you name your children. That's amazing, and I think I think there's nothing more that that I could say about you know how how much that aspect of the name matters, right? The heritage that it represents, uh, you know, the aspirations and thoughts of, of the parents. Um, the one thing I would add, and maybe this is actually uh, reflecting my name, you know, which I my parents said was expert, and I've done a lot of nerdy research on this stuff. So, uh, on the on the flip side of, of, of that, of the kind of significance that comes with the name, I think it's also worth uh, remembering that that your name is the first thing you hear as mm -hmm. a baby that identifies you to yourself as you. And in fact, there's some um, there's some neuroscience research that showed that that sound of your own name actually lights up a specific area of the brain mm -hmm. that, that is a unique thing with words and sounds um, and and they think that that's likely because of that fact that it's how it's just the sound you identify with you as yourself it's one of the first aspects of identity um, you know in, in its core form like who am I right I'm that sound so right. anyway it's an interesting thought but mm -hmm. Good. yeah or my how about you, Ed? I mean, it's all said so well. <laughs> I, just, I just also agree that it's our names are the first gift that we're given. And we're given those names with great thought, as we can see from examples we've had. We're given those names with great thought. And that we should see that outwardly as well as just our pride inward about our name. Yeah. And my final thought to anybody who's listening that um, has not gone by their real name yet or is still too afraid to speak up for themselves, it's not too late. Um, again, I've been going for 30, over 30 years of my life uh, with people not even attempting to say my name. So um, it just feels really good once people do it. Um, and I'm hoping that um, you guys hear that and you might not feel comfortable to do it yet, but I'm hoping that you will soon in your future. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists and I love just hearing everybody's perspective on what is in a name. Um, and our so our next segment is gonna be some live social um, interactions with uh, on two different platforms. One, we're gonna stay on webinar, which is this platform, and we will also be doing an Instagram live. Hafthal is going to be um, doing an interview with Alan, and Yodi is going to be doing um, an interview with Irma on uh, Instagram Live. And I will drop in the link to the Instagram Live if you want to go and hear Yodi's uh, conversation with Irma. And if you want to hear Hafthal's conversation with Alan, please just stay here. Um, and we'll give a few minutes break so we're going to get started um, at. Ooh, well, we were to start at one of the with it. So there's a few minute break and then we'll transition to the different platforms. So I'm dropping in. Ah. Sorry, I'm trying to drop in a link and it's not working. Um, Hethel, are you able to drop in the Instagram link? 
I will do that. Okay. All right. Thank you once again, everybody, for um, joining in on this conversation. I look forward to seeing you on either Instagram or oh, yeah. webinar jam. Thank you. Thank Love you. Thank you. Great to meet all of you. Bye. Great to meet you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Why? What do we call They're looking for 19. I don't know anything about that. How do I leave? Hi, Norma. Hi. 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 How do I get How do I get off? Do I get off? Do I go? Uh, yes, you can go. <laughs> um, you want me to come? I come back at two, right? I uh, will send you a link for the Zoom directly in your email. You should have. Okay, that's how this has been great. Thank you. I would love to have all those contacts, especially Praveen. That is so cool. Of course, I will definitely send you those. All right. Um, so how do I do? I just close? How do I get off yeah. the lab room? Just close. Mm -hmm. oh, all right. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. Clearly some technical difficulties with the presentation. We'll get started with Alan in just a bit.
The older I got, the more I realized the importance behind my name and why my parents gave me such a beautiful, unique name. That being said, from Eritrea, my name is Yurit Haile. My friends call me Annie and my family calls me Samai. It's only until recently that I learned how important it is to embrace and own the name that is given to you. My name is Silvana. It's important for you to say your name properly because a lot is in a name. People didn't just give you a name. They thought of it, they prayed over it, they wanted it to be said and spelled a certain way. Respect that. My name is Roidi Ruben Njeraro. So I've taken the opportunity where people have mispronounced my name to first correct them and then secondly to share and teach them the importance of those names and the significance of the person who gave me that name. It's been a great opportunity to connect with people and to share my story through my name. Hi, my name is Sarah and while my name might be easy to pronounce, it's important that all names are given the same amount of effort and respect. Most of my patients or my colleagues call me Dr. Russum or Dr. Russum. That's not my name. In my culture, my last name comes from my grandfather and his name was Russo. So I am Dr. Russo. Growing up in the 80s, I just wanted to fit in. But as I grew up, I found out my passions were creating change and fighting for justice and celebrating diversity. My name, which means create, fits my identity just perfectly. My name is Rechna Kure. Adopting a Western name did make my life easier because I became more convenient to my friends and my peers, classmates, and teachers. But if you really think about why I underwent so many name transitions and truly for whose benefit it was, it certainly wasn't all about me. I'm proudly speaking my name today. My name is Kim Myung Hua. Hi, my name is Janae, and I encourage you all to own your name, own the beauty of it, and encourage others to do the same. If someone mispronounces your name, let them know. I don't really think of my name as being mispronounced often, but it is, uh, even in my head, I think it is Michael Hernandez instead of Hernandez, just because I've heard people pronounce it that way. I learned about my family history and the legacy and what it meant to be a who in our family. And I became really proud to be Lydia Who, so much so that I couldn't bear the thought of changing my name even when I got married. It's so much a part of my identity, Lydia Who. It's special, it's unique, it's who I am, you might say. So all of this to say, if your name is special and unique and different, don't be shy to ask people to pronounce it correctly. Hi, my name is not hard to pronounce. It's Leslie Thatcher. But for many people, their names may not be familiar. They may look difficult to pronounce, but their names are their names. And we all need to work hard to make sure we are respecting everybody's preference and their identity and the meaning that their names bring to their lives, to their identity, and to their place in this world. My name is Marissa. It's the name my parents gave me in love, and it's the name I respond to. Now more than ever, it's important to say someone's name correctly and say it properly. It's a sign of recognition, a sign of acknowledgement, and a sign of respect. Hi, my name is Laura Tejas. I did not want to be rejected. I did not want those people to not remember my name. I come to realize that it's important that everyone speaks their own name. Hi, my name is Kate Cadillac, spoken but not spelled like the car. Our names are one of the most basic parts of our identity. And our name, which is so uniquely tied to their identity, deserves to be said proudly and properly. My name is Hippo Johnny. Here today, reintroducing myself as Win Jun, because that is my name, that is who I am, and I am proud of it. And that's not how you pronounce my name. My name is pronounced Fabio. Hello, my name is Dina Sayavedra. Immediately correct them, of course, with respect, with love. And um, I am very, very proud of my name and the way it is spelled. I love it because it's very unique. Now, I tell you, be proud of your name. Own it. Love it. My name 
is Damir Kirilyevich. And I strongly believe that it is important for people to make an enthusiastic effort in learning the pronunciation of names that are considered uncommon or non-traditional in this country. My name is David Shapiro. We speak each other's names and we listen to how they're pronounced. It's a way to honor our heritage, honor where we came from, honor the stories that brought us to this country. Hi, my name's Ed Bianchi. Our names are the first and most important gift that we're ever given, and they should be celebrated by everyone. Hello, my name is Veronica Puga. And hopefully we can all uh, try to pronounce everybody's name as Speak everybody's name the way that it is and not try to change it. My name is Eva Schwanchadley. I really appreciated every single person who took the time to learn how to say it correctly. A person's name is so important to who they are that I think it's really important for each of us to pronounce a person's name the way it should be. In my country of Eritrea, we traditionally take our father's first name as our last name, and he takes pride in his name. So I take pride in pronouncing my name as Amanda Bahlibi. My name is Justin Gardner, and although my name isn't as difficult to pronounce, it is still critical for everyone to make the effort to pronounce their names. My name is Alan, and while my name is not so difficult to pronounce, it is important to me that others make an effort in pronouncing your name the way it should be. We all deserve to have our names spoken correctly. Without that, who knows who you could be talking to. Hi everyone, I'm State Senator Alessandra Biaggi and I am But as an adult now, I find that I am not only proud of my name, but that I have been become more comfortable correcting people who mispronounce it or misspell it. My name is Daisha, so though not difficult to pronounce, can be read in so many different ways. It is critical for everyone to make the effort in pronouncing your name as it should be. My name is Rochelle Williams. I go by Shelly because it's easier, but really it is critical for everyone to make the effort in pronouncing names as they should be. Every name is important in its own right. My name is Isabel.
So we've clearly had technical difficulties, unfortunately, and the slides also don't want to load. We're going to begin with our workshop in just a few minutes. Okay, welcome everybody. Technology, this stuff happens. I'd like to welcome you to our next segment. Unfortunately, we did have technical difficulties with uh, Alan Headbloom, but we are going to try to figure out how to get Alan to join uh, at some point for his segment. So we do hope you can share or join in when we are able to do that for the moment. However, we are going to begin with our workshop, and we're excited to introduce you um, to our panelists, uh, to our presenters, who can, there you are. Um, and because of the theme of today, we are actually going to have you introduce yourselves. <laughs> can everybody hear me okay? Are we good? We're good. Fantastic. Okay. So um, can we turn off the slides and, and make, our, make our faces bigger? Just because, you know, I love seeing my face. <laughs> there we are. Hey. Um, awesome. Hi, everybody. Oh, and um, Yorit is still finishing up her Instagram Live. So maybe we'll just uh, vamp here for a couple of minutes while we let uh, some more folks come back. But um, we are so excited to be here. Uh, Hivel, do you want to tell the story of how we initially got connected or uh, while we're, we're waiting for everybody to convene? Yeah. So I... Um... Well, first off, I want to just say that it's critical to have uh, a lot of people understand what we're trying to do today. And I think when um, I first had posted it, Casey reached out directly and that validated not just uh, the campaign, but validated my need to have people hear my name said properly and proudly. Um, so again, when you do reach out, when you do share today, it's so critical, and Alan has just joined, um, it is so critical for you to let others know that you hear them, that you see them. So again, Casey was um, phenomenal in making that space for me to share my name by also inviting us to uh, the Vital Voice Training podcast, Voice Is, so we encourage you to um, hear that as well, and we had a great conversation. It was awesome. We love talking to you. Great. Hi, Alan. Hello. Can you see me? We cannot, but we can hear you just fine. So uh, let me find the right button. Uh, on my screen, it's uh, on the top of the uh, the top of the panel, and it's all the way to the left-hand side. There he is. <laughs> Thank you. Ta -da. Ta -da. Awesome. Well, so so Hazel, just let us know what you want to do. If you want to go ahead and talk to Alan now, or if you guys want to talk later, um, we are very we're happy to be flexible. So we're we're hanging out. Okay. Um, I'm glad to, to to take questions. I'm glad to to talk about names. So let me let me know how I can best help. So while we're waiting for people to join back here, why, uh, if that's okay, Alan, um, and this is being recorded, so we'll have the segment 
if you can share a little bit about the work that you're doing on your show and the um, you know the, the people that you've come across and why you do that, why you um, being you do that work uh, and how you make sure that uh, whoever comes on your show really feels like they belong, which is the title of your show. So if you can um, let us know that, and then Casey, Julie will, will kick it off. I wasn't trying to say your name, so I wanted you to introduce yourself, but I gave it away. Um, so we'll do that. So so hello. Um, my name is Alan Gustav Hedblum, and I'm a third-generation immigrant child. My grandparents came to the United States from Sweden, and so the name Hedblum is, uh, has been anglicized to match the pronunciation of the original Swedish, which means heather blossom, so head bloom. Um, when my grandfather came, he, it was important that he have his name pronounced correctly or as close to the Swedish as possible. And without changing the spelling, they would be saying Hedblom. And so he said, okay, I want people to get it right and without correcting them all the time. So he, he changed it. Interestingly, my uh, brother, who is an ESL teacher in Colorado, uh, decades ago changed it back to the original spelling, and his cowardly siblings did not. So, so we have people pronounce our name correctly, but his is the original spelling. In my day job, I'm an interculturalist and an applied linguist, and so I work with uh, companies helping their international employees fit in better in the American workplace and in their neighborhoods, and on the flip side, help Americans work better cross-culturally, internationally, because maybe they have uh, international co-workers or they have weekly conference calls with uh, affiliate offices in India and in China and in Brazil. So my job is basically to build bridges uh, across language and culture. Uh, an outgrowth of that work then, seven, almost eight years ago now, was to start a local TV show here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's called Feel Like You Belong. And this is basically a slogan from uh, the earliest days of my company when I was really brainstorming, you know, what is the essence of what I do in helping people fit in? Um, the understanding of belonging for me, and as, as I've come to have used that over the decades, is a really profound sense of when you walk in a space, it's a deep sigh and say, yeah, this is my place. I know these people, they know me, I have, I have respect, I have familiarity, whatever it is, it takes lots of different shapes. But belonging is, is profoundly important. And I, I take the message from the old uh, 1990s sitcom, Cheers. And if you remember, they're playing the song at the beginning, and it's basically, you always want to go where everyone knows your name, where they're always glad you came. And even if you're just this big schlub norm, who's this you know, accountant who you know, is, is a little bit unlovable, kind of dorky, he walks in the door, everyone turns around and says, hey, norm, come and have a seat, pull up a seat. And so it's that kind of really deep, profound belonging that that I'm striving to bring. And so the TV show has really two aspects to it. It's helping educate, helping inform newcomers about American culture, about American English, so that they can be more and more comfortable as they uh, begin working with you know, their, their coworkers, with their neighbors, if they start to join organizations and committees of how do they fit in better. And on the flip side, helping non immigrant Americans understand what that immigrant journey is because, you know, after a couple of generations, a lot of us lose that connection to whatever the old homeland was. And then we just naturally grow blinders. And that's a real detriment because that makes us sort of ignore or, or make assumptions about people that, well, they're just like us or they want to be just like us. And a really critical point, um, in our work, both in, in my in my day job and on the TV show, is to draw a distinction between the concept of assimilation, which I profoundly do not buy into, and acculturation. Acculturation means here are the rules of the road. Here are some tips to help you get along better. You know, here's how to do a North American handshake. Right, you reach in, 
web to web, uh, you know, medium firm, two or three pumps, let go. That's just how we operate here. And you may be from a culture that doesn't do that. You know, I'm not saying there are, there are ironclad rules, but if you want to, you know, perform well in American business culture, meet neighbors or have them think like you're an okay person, there are some things you have to do. On the other hand, you don't have to, you know, change your name because it has multiple syllables. And so what is that sort of middle ground of fitting into the culture, acculturating without assimilating, which means basically you lose everything about you so that you just blend in. And so that's that's the sort of space that I, I've been navigating for the last, uh, well, the last several decades, but on the TV show, um, the last uh, seven years. And for people tuning in right now, um, if you want to um, follow the TV show, it's easy to find, feellikeyoubelong.com. Uh, all the materials there are free. Uh, if you're an ESL teacher, we've got lots of stuff on American English, uh, pronunciation, slang, vocabulary, grammar, and then on the flip side, American culture, how to behave, how to engage in small talk in your neighbor with your neighbors, et cetera. So um, all free resources. We have over 150 interviews with newcomers to the United States, uh, including a couple of the people who were uh, uh, participants on the panel just uh, earlier this afternoon, and they tell their own unique stories. Uh, we had one really profound uh, feedback, piece of feedback from uh, a viewer on the show. He was an older white male in his 80s from uh, suburban Detroit. And he wrote in the first sentence was, we have an immigration problem in this country. But after I watched your show, and it was in particular a story about a Central American fellow who came to the United States without papers, age 18, with his then girlfriend, now wife. They crossed the border uh, in Arizona without papers. Uh, they were robbed. They were penniless, worked hard, uh, often taken advantage of because they had no papers, worked hard, settled in Michigan, uh, eventually got green uh, a green card. They're now citizens. Uh, he has a small uh, maintenance company, employs half a dozen local Grand Rapidians. If you were to walk into any space in the United States and say, anyone, raise your hand if you employ, if you sign a weekly paycheck for half a dozen people. Most of us are, you know, we're, we're sitting on our hands. And here's this plucky young man who at the age of 18 said, you know, I got no future in Central America, walk the length of Mexico, which is not safe, and said, I'm going to I'm going to make a fresh start. And then when this this elderly white male who is not a big fan of immigration said, you know, when I see this story, I begin to see him as a human being, you know, highlight of our week to get a comment like this, because this is how I think we change hearts and minds is through through telling stories. Now, I know that the um, the theme of the show uh, of this uh, of this webinar is on names. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, names and um, how that relates to my work. Um, I have a have a deep respect for people's names because they bring who they are from all over the world. And the name, as we saw from the panelists earlier, represents not just uh, a person's original uh, language and culture, but also the deep, uh, especially in cases like Ruidi, um, the deep aspirations of the parents when they bestow a name. One exercise I like to do in, when I give this presentation on the importance of getting names right is that the early on in the session, I have you people turn to their neighbors and say, tell the tell your partner, what are your three or maybe if you're from Britain, you've got four names. What are your names? And what do they mean? What's the significance of them? And, you know, do you have a nickname? In other words, because and and that is the noisiest room to be in when you get people having a chance to actually talk about themselves and where they come from and their names. And, you know, not everyone has a, a wonderful, interesting name like Roidi, Ruben and Geraru. I mean, there are some Bob Smiths out there who say, well, my name's Bob Smith. But listening to other people, then you start to hear how profound and how deeply rooted some of these these origins are. And if you are, you know, the beloved only granddaughter of, you know, 
uh, great grandma Imogene and you got that name, this is an honorific that you are carrying because she is the beloved matriarch of the family. So these, these experiences help people open up a little bit more uh, and especially in a monolingual, monocultural uh, society like the US still is in many, many places. This is a way of just beginning to open people up. And so I recommend uh, for the educators watching today, you know, give that a try. That's a that's a real icebreaker and uh, begins to open up people to uh, new understandings of this whole business. Um, We're going to be doing some uh, exercises just like that here in just a couple of minutes. Yay. Great. Great. So um, and before I blab on, how many minutes do you want me to talk before you need to cut me off? I think they're actually about to start um, if we have half an hour. So I think, yeah, that, and if you can um, wrap up with, I guess, your final thoughts, especially letting us know how we can watch you on your show, because I think it's incredibly important. Again, feellikeyoubelong.com. Uh, you can subscribe to our free newsletter. We, we send out uh, free newsletters with uh, tips on American English, American culture, and a weekly interview uh, spanning the newcomer experience. So um, names are super important. Uh, if you meet people and you don't get their name, don't be embarrassed. You're going to say, gee, I'm sorry. I, I don't have a stone ear. Can you just repeat that? <laughs> and you try to say it again and you still don't get it. That's okay. They're used to this. You know, just say it again. I'm sorry. I really want to get it. And then there are tricks. You know, by the end of the the networking conversation, because you're moving to another group, you say, "Okay, it was great to meet you, Roidi. Did I get that right, Roidi? You know, if if you say it more, you'll get it more. And you there you can create mnemonics. There are lots of tricks, but there's nothing more respectful. And if you if you think about the profound disrespect implied in in the in the question, uh, can I just call you Bud? You know, the flip side of that is, you know, honoring who they are, how they came to this place and um, that will light up their heart and you'll have a new friend. All right. So I think we um, we have about a 45 minute workshop that we're going to need to do in about 30 minutes now. So we're going to jump uh, jump in if that's all right. Yes. Thank you so much, Alan. And again, please definitely watch the show. It's I've seen a couple of episodes and it's been it's been very helpful. Um, take it away. Thank awesome. You. Hi, everybody. Uh, oh, I'm gonna. Alan, can do you mind muting? There we go. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Casey Aaron Clark. I am a three named human because uh, of the Actors Union. I uh, come from a professional acting background. Um, but yes, yeah, so I had to add Aaron to my name when I joined the Actors Union. <laughs> Julie, do I have you? Maybe Julie. There we go. There we go. Yes. I am, yes, I thought I had mastered that. Um, I'm Julie <laughs> Fogg. I uh, have a last name that's four letters, but um, like uh, Alan was talking about Scandinavian, it's a Scandinavian name. So we, as a family, sort of have made a collective decision to not pronounce it as it would be in Danish, which is more akin to the F word. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm, I'm familiar with nobody being able to pronounce my last name, um, but my first name being Julie, it's a pretty international name. I've never dealt with somebody not being able to pronounce my first name. So this is just fascinating to me and we're so excited to talk mm -hmm. to you today. So we've already established uh, today many times that that your name is so much more than just like a, letter, a collection of letters and sounds, right? It carries your identity, it carries your cultural history, it carries emotional connotations, it carries memories in it. Um, and uh, th there's a story that we tell about one of our clients. We help people pronounce their names all the time. We work with people on introducing themselves with confidence, and that is what we're gonna do today in this workshop. We're gonna give you some exercises, we're gonna give you some tips and tricks, we're gonna give you some scripts on how to respond when people get your name wrong, and how to deal with the discomfort that comes from that. Um, but just a quick story about one of our clients, and, and this will make sense, I think, uh, very, very quickly. She told us uh, kind of early on in her coaching sessions that she always had to repeat herself when she introduced herself at like a networking event or something. And, uh, and we said, interesting, uh, do us a favor for the next week uh, when you're introducing yourself, we really, 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 really want you to say 
the every single letter in your name. Give it all the good energy, especially the final letter of your name. And she came back to us the next week and she was like, oh my gosh, Casey, every time I said my name this week, the response was, what a beautiful name. Her name was Moon Kim, but she had been saying it, hello, my name is Moon. And it kind of fell back into herself a little bit. And this is something that we notice a lot, right, Julie? I'm trying to do the muting thing to be polite. Yes, it's when we, we're talking with people about names and we see this across the board, people look at their name as an obstacle to the beginning of whatever they're really trying to get to and very often rush through them. So we see when people are starting a presentation, for example, my name's Julie and I'm here to talk to you today about. So it's this kind of inconvenient prelude when in fact, if you think about it as the beginning of what you're trying to say, and you can insert the identity of the person who's going to be giving you this information and give that as much value, both for yourself and also for your audience. We find that audiences actually really like when people take time with their names mm -hmm. because it allows them to hear it. It allows them to know who is speaking and not have to look, oh, who's that? What's their name? So the, it's a gift to take time with your name and not rush through it, which is the first place we wanna start with. Mm -hmm. all of this. <laughs> so we are voice and public speaking coaches. Uh, we, as I said, we come to this from a theater background. So a lot of the way that we think about communication comes from the theater world, but we think about your voice in a very specific way. Your voice is this whole complex world. And the way that we're gonna talk about names today is by using those four arenas that we use when we talk about the voice. And that's the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the social. I'm gonna do a lightning quick introduction of what each of those four things are when it comes to your voice. So the physical voice is literally, how do I create sound, right? It's a physical process of creating sound that involves breath and vibration and resonance. Then there's the mental piece of the voice, which is how do my thoughts become speech? And how sometimes do my thoughts help me? And sometimes how do my thoughts get in my way when I'm speaking? Then we've got the emotional piece of voice and, and we don't think about this a lot necessarily, but I think we all know intuitively that our voices are incredibly reflexive and responsive to how we're feeling, especially when we're feeling big emotions like stress or anger or love or passion or whatever. And then there's the social piece of voice. And we've already spent a lot of time talking about this today. The social piece of voice, basically your voice and your communication style is made up of every single interaction that you've ever had in your whole life. But not just the ones that you are a part of, they're also uh, the ones that you witness in the society and the culture that you're in, right? What is considered interesting? What is considered intelligent? What is considered uh, charismatic? What is considered boring? And we make these adjustments both consciously and subconsciously to fit in, to survive, and also to succeed or stand out. So all of these things make up the world of your voice. They're also a convenient frame for looking at your name. And that's how we're gonna start. We're gonna start with the physical aspect of saying your name. The foundation of all of voice work is something that we, we don't think about very much, even though it's the basis, it's the most important thing you didn't know was the most important thing, which is our breath. Because we, to make voice happen, we need to speak on an exhale. But right now we're in this strange cultural time where I call it a post breath culture. So we've just gotten habitually holding our breaths, talking down here, kind of keeping it all maintained and not using breath in order to power your voice. And this is really important to understand because when we are taking that time space to say our voices, when we do want the volume for it to be heard, to understand how to speak on that exhale and also to be aware of your breath as it, it stands in relation, we'll talk about nerves and stress, the act of holding our breath it breaths, mm. breath is a way of controlling uh, both how much stimulus gets into us as people and how much we're outputting. So we, we do use holding breath as a tool to protect ourselves. But when we're talking about communicating, it's really critical that we start to learn how to use the breath and ride the waves of the breath instead of just closing it off because it feels easier or safer or smaller. So that's something we work on a lot. And it's really relevant, I think, to making the sentence of your name, that your name is a complete sentence. It starts with an inhale, you say your name, it buttons with a period. So then you can move on to the next breath. It gets its own breath. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to do some exercises today. Obviously, we are not in the same room with each other. We cannot see you or hear you, sadly. Um, but we're hoping that you'll do some of these exercises with us wherever you are. Uh, and the very first exercise is going to be about connecting air and sound. And it's really easy. All you're going to do is you're going to take an inhale. You're going to let that inhale expand your body. And then right on the exhale, you're going to say, hi, my name is first name, just your first name. And let's just add just for fun. Hi, my name is first name period to that sentence. So uh, I'm gonna count to three. We're all gonna breathe in. You can breathe in with me and wherever you are, I just want you to say, hi, my name is, in my case, Casey, period. Let's do all, let's do all that together. One, two, three. Hi, my name is my Casey, name is Julie, period. period. <laughs> and hopefully that just gives you a little sense of just how powerful breath is. What often we see when we uh, when we talk about breath is that someone will go, okay, I know I'm supposed to take a deep breath before I speak. And they'll go, hi, my name is Casey. And they'll breathe out half of their fuel before they even use it. So really thinking about beginning the sentence on the exhale is a powerful way to increase volume, increase resonance, increase presence in your voice. So now let's get to the names specifically. And we're going to talk about sounds and articulators. So as we established this morning, all languages are made up of sort of a different library of sounds. And the more languages you know, the more access to this library of sounds you have. All of your names are made up of sounds, no matter where they come from in the world. And all of those sounds are created in your mouth in different ways. Lips, teeth, tongue, these are our tools, right? So really quickly, everybody, let's just say, let's just keep it to first name for now, just to keep it simple. Just your first name and just think through the letters of your name and the sounds of your name, right? So in my case, I have a hard C. A, C, E are the sounds of my name. K, A, C, E. And the A is a very American Midwestern A because I'm from, from the Midwest, so it's really wide. A and the C, right? Casey, that's my name. Julie, do you want to do yours? Yeah. Also, I just want to add with, with Casey, with your beautiful A vowel, it's something in the phonetic world called a triff song, which uh, means yes. it's a. three vowels. Yeah. It's yeah. I. So that's exciting. And that's something to be able to lean into when you're taking space in your name is what are these different vowels? So my name, Casey and I were laughing yesterday at my high school spelling when I thought I wanted to make my name cooler, but my name's Julie. So there's a J, which is, can be either in, if it's in French, it's a nice Julie, which I love. Um, in Danish, it's more like Julia, but in American English, it's Julie. I've got this nice J and then U and then Lee. So I don't really have any exciting triff songs or anything in my name, it's just three <laughs> little syllables. If I'm not careful with my name, I can swallow that long E on the end. Mm -hmm. I can do Julie. And I once actually did that when I was sick and got my food um, and it was, is chili here? Is chili? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so really just recognizing those little parcels of sound and um, being able to separate them even from the letters. So this is something, um, what Casey was talking about, the sounds from all languages, there's something called the International Phonetic Alphabet, which is can be complex and have all kinds of confusing symbols in it, but it does represent the idea that our sounds are just that, they're parcels of sound, and you map them differently based on what it is you want people to hear as opposed to clinging to, oh, that's an L, it must sound like this, to give some flexibility. And I think that's just important to consider when we're thinking about names, um, like, Hetal versus Hetal would be completely different spelled IPA next to each other. So you'd be able to see a distinct difference. Um, and I, I just think embracing what those sounds are gives you that freedom and that uh, deeper vocabulary to be able to explain your name to people as sounds. So let's talk about rhythm of names, Julie. So we were talking about this earlier, thinking about just is your, what's the rhythm of your name? Rhythm is just as important as the sounds we have. Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it um, direct? Is it indirect? Is it light? Is it heavy? And just giving yourself a sense of a vocabulary of how you talk about your name. So Julie, it's pretty fluid. It's pretty direct, but pretty even, definitely slow. 
Um, and that just gives a certain feeling to it, a bounce to it, a way of understanding. And I guess this also ties into <laughs> when you hear people say your name with intention, uh, which we'll talk about later, how that affects the rhythm of it. And you can hear that, oh, J Julie Eileen Fogg, I'm in trouble. And that's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> mom voice. Julie, yeah, mom voice. Uh, we, we have different rhythms for different purposes, but I, I, yeah. Casey, go ahead. So there's a little homework for you. Think about the rhythm of your name and think about the rhythm of your name as being somewhat flexible and somewhat under your control, right? So my name is Casey. It's a little fast, it's a little light, it's a little it's a little zippy, but I could say Casey and it could have a totally different meaning or a totally different rhythm to it. So it's a place where you can play. Um, so I'm just keeping an eye on our time here. We're gonna jump to the mental aspect of saying your name and just talk really briefly about that. Um, we all have a lot of thoughts and memories around our name. Uh, we talked to Hithel on our on our podcast about her formative memory memory of hearing someone get her name wrong, which was when she was in first grade and she had a teacher just basically refuse to pronounce it correctly. That's a deep memory that's kind of always going to be there. She also told us a really powerful story of how when she wants to pronounce her name with intention and with its beautiful Indian pronunciation, she thinks about a family member when she does that. That's kind of a beautiful demonstration of the power of thought and how we how we jump into that mental component of saying our names with pride. Um, we also have these logical uh, observations that we make throughout our lives about how people react to our names. Um, and we we can we start to make associations. We start to like and make assumptions, which is sometimes helpful and sometimes not. Right? If you're used to having your name pronounced poorly, uh, it's really easy to go into every interaction with an assumption that someone's going to pronounce your name poorly. And I think it's up to you to decide how to handle that and how how that either serves you or doesn't serve you in the interaction that you're with, that you're in right now. Because sometimes what that does is if we assume that someone's going to get our name wrong, that causes stress to rise. It also causes, as we, Julie and I were discussing this morning, sort of this anguish, but also like a pre-annoyance, which might cause us to go into every conversation with a little bit of like, I hate you. Like I haven't even talked to you yet, but I hate you. Which just, is just waiting for you to get it wrong. Place. It's not a great place to start a relationship with anybody. It also completely makes sense uh, for someone who repeatedly is having the frustration of having their name pronounced correctly. But I think getting your thoughts, getting your getting your uh, ideas around your name um, written out and thought out is can be a really powerful way to to move forward in how you want your name to be said in the world. Julie, shall we jump to the emotional section of names? Go for it. <laughs> Talk about our feelings around our names, Julie. Uh, we have we have strong feelings about our names. As it was covered this morning. We have identity associated with our names. We have, and I like I was just saying, we we also can feel the emotion of the intent behind how people say our names. I have um, a couple of people named. Phil in my life. So there's somebody who I don't care for. And when I reference his name, it's Phil. And I have a dear, dear friend who, when I refer to as, oh, I was talking to Phil today, no one ever mistakes one for the other and they're the same <laughs> name. So that emotion behind it, which can also extend that, that kind of nuance that we give to other people's names, uh, extending that to yourself. Because we've talked a lot about you know other people saying our names, which is critical. And we want to talk about how to deal with that when people don't, but also how you feel about your name, that that embracing that pride, that ownership of, I am allowed this time parcel to express my identity here and to develop a relationship with those sounds. I, I think it's also connected to, you know, the identities we want to bring into the world and into different settings. We carry that with our names, which is just really critical. So we kind of want to do a fun exercise with developing a, dare I say it, sexy relationship with your name. Um, <laughs> a, a juicy, a juicy, lovely, pleasurable relationship with your name. So, <laughs> so one of my one of my favorite novels is called The Red Tent, uh, and it's it's set in. Uh, biblical times, but it's the story of some of the women in the Bible. And, and, I, and I, love this, uh, I love this quote from the book, so I'm just gonna read it to you. It's a wonder that any mother ever called a daughter Dina again, but some did. 
Maybe you guessed that there was more to me than the voiceless cipher in the text. Maybe you heard it in the music of my name, the first vowel high and clear, as when a mother calls to her child at dusk, the second sound soft for whispering secrets on the pillow, Dina. So um, we're gonna take 60 seconds right now. And if you have a phone in your hand, if you have access to a pencil and paper, uh, I wanna give you a, a prompt, which is to write a description of your name like a novel. How would your favorite novelist describe the sound and the energy of your name? So we're gonna give you 60 seconds to do that right now. And if anybody wants to share in the chat what they came up with, I would love to hear it. All right, 60 seconds. And it can be a, it can be precious. The, the beauty of using an example of a romance novel is that it doesn't have to be so serious. There's, it's, it's a serious topic, but there can be pleasure within that. Mm -hmm. P.S. We did not do this homework, so we would have to think about it. <laughs> Says you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Julie, then you're going to have to share. All right. Got about 30 seconds left. We do not force shares, by the way, so only voluntary shares. How would your favorite novelist describe your name? Okay, well, so if anybody wants to share their results in the chat box, that would be amazing. Uh, but we are going to go on to the social aspect of names because again, I'm keeping an eye on our time here and I wanna make sure that we get to the how to respond when people get it wrong. We've got a couple more exercises for you. Julie, you wanna talk about the social uh, aspect of names and cultural identity and stuff? Yeah, I think we really had such a good discussion on that in the presentations earlier. It is mm -hmm. undisputable that our names are connected to where we're from, who we are. Um, so many people said beautiful things about parents in the video we watched praying over the name. Um, my, my name was really more because I wasn't a boy, so I didn't get Travis. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I also have friends for whom their names are deeply meaningful, both you know, for who they are, but as markers in time in their family history. So mm -hmm. just you know, considering where that name sits in the larger picture of, of this history of where we're from and the languages that we speak and the struggles of our, of our family to get us to this point of being out in the world, um, all of just these, these threads connecting back to an identity that anchors us, I, I such, I just love that we carry this little parcel of sound that's not just us, but the whole kind of history of where we come from. And it's influenced within our society, you know, we or individual societies like family, that's normal. And we hear that as reflected normal. And then going into the world where someone reflects that back is abnormal or odd or, um, unusual as we were talking about that mm -hmm. that conflict that abrupt hitting of a mirror that's reflecting back something confusing instead of something beautiful that is stressful that's uncomfortable it's mm -hmm. hard on the soul to experience so as we kind of go through the rest of the presentation we're going to talk a little bit more about how to deal with those moments of somebody denying your your name and therefore identity as well mm -hmm. so Quickly, we're gonna do another little exercise. And this one I would love to hear in the chat box because it's maybe a little bit less pressure than write your name like a novelist. Um, and this is another exercise that's about finding the pleasure in your name, finding the beauty in your name, finding the sensuality in your name. And we don't mean sensuality like sexiness. We mean like literally sensual of the senses. So my question for everybody is, what does your name taste like and uh Hithel, do you want to turn on your camera if you're if you're uh hanging out at your desk right now do you want to turn on your camera and tell us when we ask you this question what your answer was yeah so uh immediately my name just um struck me as indian spices so mm. uh, part of the podcast that i was talking about is how not being able to say my name alienates uh, essentially half of my identity so when i do hear my name properly I'm just recounting all the Indian spices, which is so closely tied to my 
Indian side of me. Mm -hmm. And your name doesn't have to taste necessarily like a cultural food that you love. That can be a really powerful reference for you. But maybe your name tastes like strawberries and cream, or maybe your name tastes like Pop Rocks. Oh, yes. Will you please say that out loud for us? Will you turn on your camera and say that out loud for us? Oh my God. Yes, I love so that. this is Swin Jen. Yeah. Hi, Swin <laughs> so Jen. the first thing that came up in my head was Pop Rocks because it's very shocking at first to people, but then they realize that it's a lot of fun um, and then they can keep saying it and having it. So, I love yeah. that. Okay, so now would you do me a favor? Because will you be a test subject for us for just one moment? Can you just okay. say with the air behind it, hi, my name is first name, but can you picture Pop Rocks when you say your name? Can you almost feel them in your <laughs> mouth while you say it? Just say um, that. Hi, my name is Huynh Jun. Yes, I love that. It was great. I felt like I could see the energy of the pop rocks in your delivery there, which is fantastic. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm gonna get back to my notes here. So this is a really important section. Um, I'm hoping maybe we can buy a couple minutes over 2 p.m. because I think this is really, really important to talk about. This is the this is where we're gonna start talking about how do you respond when someone gets your name wrong. Um, and there's a there's a lot around this that we need to kind of piece through. So, Julie, would you like to talk about discomfort in your body? Yeah, there's as we talked about earlier, that discomfort can be anything from being overlooked to just the annoyance that someone can't get it, or even why is it my responsibility to have to correct mm -hmm. somebody over and over? That's th those are all completely understandable and you know normal reactions. But looking at what they do to our bodies, that's where we want to jump in. Because the discomfort we talked about at the beginning, you know, holding your breath to manage discomfort. There's also um, holding your breath is a big one. Tensing up, shrinking. These are all things directly connected to fight or flight, which is where when we have big emotions or big feelings, we tend to go. Our emotions actually trigger emergency responses to us because we, we were so afraid of emotions. But that's a completely different workshop. <laughs> um, but in this... To be able to just notice for your own, not to judge, not to say, oh, I shouldn't do that, or even really anything along that path, but just notice, gosh, when somebody gets my name wrong, I lock up in my jaw, something here starts to go into breastplate mode instead of like heart center open mode. It goes into something focused and um, uncomfortable and I'm not in my own center and I'm not in my own place. It, it can also be called emotional hijacking if you read Daniel, Daniel Goleman's work on emotional intelligence. And when you've skipped to that place, it's really hard to even take that moment to step back to do what we're going to talk about with correcting people. Mm -hmm. So just when you can notice those sensations that happen, what you can take it back to are two things. Number one, grounding yourself, which means um, we talk about gravitas a lot, which literally means gravity. And that's making a conscious choice to, for example, unclench your butt, which is a big one where people tend to constrict when you don't want anyone else to know that you're about to burn with the fiery rages of hell. If you can sit in, we call it let your butt be big, to give the furniture your weight, or if you're standing, you're not doing any sort of micro contractions, that starts to send a signal to your body that it's safe. And then remembering to breathe. We aren't even going to talk about how to breathe, just to remember to breathe, because it's very likely in those scenarios that you've been holding your breath. My response sometimes when people get my name wrong, which I have a I have a fairly easy name. Again, we keep putting quotes around this because again, what's unusual, what's easy is entirely culturally specific. But what people often do with my name is they call me Cassie or they call me something that rhymes with Casey that's a little bit more familiar like Stacy or sometimes they call me by my middle name because they've seen my, my name written out so they call me Aaron. I, because I was raised in this very polite Midwestern culture, kind of often freeze in a smile and sometimes I choose not to address it, right? Which is not great. Like I would like for people to get my name right. But I wanna talk really quickly because, because again, my response is don't make them uncomfortable which is sort of a sub genre of freeze. We call it fawn. It's like, if I'm nice to the predator, then they won't eat me. That's literally what your brain is doing to you. Do you need to address other people's discomfort when they get your name wrong? There is no good answer to this question, right? I can't tell you, yes, you should address their comfort, their discomfort. And I also can't tell you, 
your, their discomfort is not your responsibility. Their discomfort is not your responsibility. But sometimes because of a power differential, sometimes because of a social situation, you do want to be the generous one. Again, let's be clear, you shouldn't have to be, but you do want to be the generous one and kind of help them along, right? So there are lots of ways to do that, um, that hopefully can feel good to you and not feel like something that you have to do. So, so we want to talk about kind of giving you some helpful scripts. And we actually would love to crowdsource these scripts. So, um, so if our two ladies wouldn't mind uh, turning on their cameras again, and we can kind of talk through some of the ways that you all have addressed names in the past, people getting your names wrong. Um, and we want to talk about like lots of ideas for our for our workshop participants of how they can how they can have these maybe difficult and a little bit uncomfortable conversations uh, in the future. So um, one that we see a lot, and I'm wondering if either of you have done this, is creating a mnemonic device around your name. Um, a couple of people mentioned this earlier today, like that my name is blank, like blank thing that rhymes with it. Somebody, uh, Vega, said, uh, said Vegas without the S. That's a really helpful mnemonic device. Sometimes you wanna come up with a, a mnemonic device. Um, have either of you done that before? Yeah, the second part of my name, um, a lot of people mispronounce that part, so I explain it like it's junk without the K. That's really easy, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, totally. For me, um, it's been, it's Ethel with an H in front. Mm -hmm. I mean, always, but more recently it's been, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then we want to talk about kind of like the, the, the polite way to address it when somebody gets your name wrong and then the very direct way to address it when somebody gets your name wrong. Julie, do you want to, do you want to talk about the, the, the polite way or the polite energy? Yes. Um, first, just what, what you guys both did. Thank you so much for adding those in. That's, I call that the teaching method and things like mnemonics all fall into now yeah, i'm going to teach you i'm going to instruct you the next two i call the door shut and the door slam um <laughs> so the door the door shut really is following teaching okay someone says it again they don't quite get it right it's a good try not quite right try this and continuing the education process it doesn't it means you're not just well uh, giving up fine you don't get it it's but it also acknowledges, okay, there's more work to do. You know, there's that affirmation. You talk about crucial conversations. It's the, the nonviolent communication route. And that takes emotional energy. It's an option. Um, but I, I also just think the door slam method is really useful too, which is just, that's not my name. To just be able to practice saying, that's not my name. I think we have a lot of emotions around this and being able to lean in to saying to yourself, that's not my name, that's not my name, and accessing all of those feelings in that door slam, uh, I think is useful both to honor your own feelings and also it's not unreasonable to tell someone that's not my name. If somebody named Bob keeps getting called Jack, they're going to say that's not my name. Um, and I think we have a reluctance to do that due to you know, politeness, but I don't think it is impol I don't think it is unkind it might not be quote polite, but you know, honestly is accommodation what we're really looking for. If you're getting what you need and it's ultimately kind to do that, I, I'm a fan of that direct and of practicing that direct. So you know you're making a choice if you want to move to the softer versions instead of feeling like you have to do that to be quote nice to people. Mm -hmm. Do we, I, do you, first of all, any thoughts on that or any responses to that from, from you all? Um, so because I'm, say, yeah, go ahead. Because you, because you showed that it's funny because I've never um, done the the hard slam approach before. I've always just kind of ignored it or been done a soft approach. But when I did the video, my name video, um, it just felt natural to me to do the hard slam because I wasn't actually facing somebody. Um, I was facing the camera, so I'm like, oh well. And I don't know if you've all heard it, but in my video, I actually say that's not my name. Um, yeah. But in person, it's easier <laughs> to do that. Oh yeah, of course it is. Yeah, I was gonna say something similar. Um, that in my name video, I felt a lot more confident because I could re-record -re myself multiple times. And so I felt uh, confident to um, be able to say, like, that's not even close to how you pronounce my name. Um, and it took me a few takes to be able to do, do that. So hopefully, like, 
I'll have the confidence one day to be able to do that hard slam, but I'm not quite there yet. It takes again, practice. The idea that it, you, you, know, you just arrive there is it's both learning how to have those feelings in your body. So when they come, it's not like this stop sign that says, oh, I did it wrong because that was uncomfortable. And it's also something I firmly believe in education, which is you have to be able to say no in order to be able to fully say yes. So practicing that that no, even if it's on your own, just starts to recalibrate you know, what it is that is in the comfort zone. So instead of feeling like, you know, it has to always be done in front of people. I love that you said on camera, there was nobody to, to push back. Great. That's the baby step, I think, to getting just even used to having the, I'll use the word audacity to protect your own name, which is kind of something that is part of the initial seedling of all of this is do I have, am I allowed to, do I have permission to give you giving yourself permission? I love that. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, throw them into chat. Otherwise, uh, we will wrap this up so that you guys can talk to Alessandra, who we've met, who is amazing. She is so fantastic. So I just want to do a quick shout to, um, yeah, some of the comments. Bianca, who's one of our students, said that she just keeps calm and tells people multiple times mm -hmm. um, and helps them pronounce it until they get it right. And I understand that and do my best to help them say it well, which is amazing because I don't think I've had that courage at such a young age. Uh, and Marissa said the hard slam is hard, which yes. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Standing in your power is a hard thing to do. It's a hard, and it take, and especially I think for, for women, because of how we are acculturated across cultures in the world, you know, we're supposed to be accommodating, we're supposed to, uh, to take on discomfort ourselves, but never ever make anyone else uncomfortable. And and the ability to, I think, hold uh, hold discomfort in your own body and not treat it as a stop sign, as Julie said, and, and to stand in your power to stay grounded and to, on your breath, say your name with all of those sounds energized and present with pleasure and pride. Um, the more people stand up and do that, the easier it is for other people to stand up and do that. Um, we often talk about how we have a responsibility to, like when we see interruptions happening in the office, for example, sometimes it's easier to stand up for somebody else than it is to stand up for yourself. So you have the opportunity also to say, um, I don't think that we're pronouncing her name right, and that we, of course, means them, but you can help other people get their names pronounced correctly, and maybe that'll give you the courage, again, to take that stand, to take that brave stand, and, and say your name with the pleasure and the pride that it deserves. And just asking the question, you know, do I, is it my mission to be convenient for others, or do I want to be memorable? I think is just, and I think everyone wants to be memorable. Uh, politeness is often just about being convenient and I don't think we need that right now. <laughs> nope, not if we wanna change the world. And I think a lot of people in this conversation wanna change the world. Thank you so much for inviting us to be part of this. We're so proud to be here and help all of you guys and learn from all of you as well. Quinn Jun will take it away. Um, thank you again from my end, but uh, this was amazing for me. We are gonna hop on to the Zoom link uh, with Senator Alessandra Biagi. So please join us there for a youth town hall with Alessandra Biagi and some of our students. Awesome. Yeah, so I just sent in the the link and the password um, is one, two, three, four for everybody to click on. So I look forward to seeing you guys over there. See ya. Bye.